So we we'll, just going to keep getting louder. So first, let me just say, and you'll see over the next 30 or so minutes, and where's Kristen? Where is she to cut me off? Okay. Make sure you play me down or in the five minutes. Only. And how much time do I have right now? 20, 20, 25, okay. Uh, first, let me say how excited I am professionally and personally, both from a person in the industry and as a Texan, that you all are all assembled here. You are the nine regions, the nine teams that took this initiative that you saw the federal government start, but more importantly, we can, hey, can we turn this down? Because I'm just going to keep getting louder. <laughs> You find a guy to do it, and when I get so excited, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> no, really. Um, but what we have, by your leadership, is a real opportunity to do something that will have lasting impact on the entire country. And I'm very excited, also, the fact that as a Texan, I have a biography that kind of matches this room. My first Army assignment 22 plus years ago in 1994 was at Fort Bliss in El Paso. I lived there off and on through a couple of assignments, and so I saw not only the organization, the culture, the city, the challenges, but the opportunities. But most importantly, I married Amy, my wife, uh, who her parents still live in the west side, right off I-10, over by Aaron's Bar and Grill, if you know what I'm talking about. So for the El Paso team, my hat's there you go. My hat's off to you. I spent uh, my company command time in the Army after I traveled around the country a little bit at Fort Hood, Texas. Fort Hood, Texas, one of the largest, along with Fort Bliss, Army posts in the entire country. But that's where I got to understand the real pride of the rest of the state. So El Paso is almost its own entity out there on the West State. And then you have that culture of Central Texas. I've sent two daughters now to college in Dallas. So I've really begun to understand the unique blend of what makes the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But in addition to being a family man and an army man, I became a businessman. And in that time, I spent a lot of time in Houston, working with Tom and his team over Houston Metro, in San Antonio, and of course I live here in Austin. Thank you. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out that my wife's absolute favorite place to vacation in the state is Port A, right across from Corpus Christi. So I think I've covered all of the teams, and for the team R&D, come on, I'm a nerd at heart, so I've got you all as well. But i got to uh, start with a slide, though, which is from Secretary Fox. And it keys on the notion of where we have a real opportunity as a legacy of 100 years of transportation that was geared around the automobile. We, and when I say we, I mean Texans in this state, have a chance to focus it back on people. When we started Ride Scout, and there's Craig, my co-founder from five and a half years ago, right here uh, sitting at the front table. When we started this company and we said we were going to do it in Texas, people told us we were crazy. They said, Texans love their cars. And I said, oh, no, no, Texans love their freedom. The problem is they think freedom is related to their cars, and we're here to change that. And so we've been on this journey, but the problem is, as Secretary Fox has identified, we're facing 100 years of work that's centered around the automobile. You all the experts, I'm not going to tell you what, we, what happened to our communities when we started putting roads down, we started splitting communities because we wanted to move cars faster rather than people faster. And when you talk about the challenges that you all have in this room, this is where we end up. This is a bridge going from Philadelphia over into Camden. It's completely jammed with cars in every direction. It's got structural engineering, the likes of which they can hold hundreds and thousands of cars during a given minute. Under all elements, it's engineering at its greatest, but its result is ridiculous. You see, it doesn't help if people can't get to where they're trying to go to get to the job they need to on time, to get to the education they need to move up in life, or just to see their friends and go and have a good time. And the reason why I love this picture is because we're talking about government, and so many of you all are in government or represent government, that's Philadelphia that they're going in and out of. That's in many ways the cradle in this country of our government. And as hard and as focused as they were for making good government, this photo, like all of our communities too often, 
didn't put the same focus on the movement of people instead of the movement of cars. So I'm gonna hit these three points as quickly as I can, but most importantly, this conversation does not stop today. This conversation and your workshops do not end when you take your badges off and go home. Just check and see if I have my badge on. It doesn't end because we have to continue the conversation. So the fact that you had Columbus here this morning was fantastic. That Smart Cities program was awesome. They are leading the way for that city. But folks, as Mark Dow pointed out, as Rob Spiller commented, if we can harness all of these regions working in step, and by the way, I'm certainly not going to say together the same way because these eight different regions and 19 is a very diverse group. Hell, we were our own country before. Each one of these regions could be their own country and still be economically viable. So we're going to hit collaboration, public-private partnerships. We're going to look at what it means to be lean. And the context that I'm giving it to you from is my perspective. That is someone who grew up in government. I understand after 20 years in the Army what bureaucracy means. I lived it. But I also know that there's a way to go around bureaucracy. There's a way without being illegal, unethical, or immoral. There's a way to still get stuff done in government. But I also come at this from a startup. When Craig and I started this company five and a half years ago, we barely had two nickels to rub together. But now today, we not only built a company, but it was then acquired by Mercedes. So let me give you the other perspective that I can give you today, which is that of a giant private corporation that has a mission to help society, but it has a bottom line to help investors. So I can speak and translate a lot of this in a lot of different ways, but my favorite way to speak this to you all today is as a Texan who chose to live in Texas after I retired from the Army. This is where I want to put down my roots and will stay until uh, the end. You remember nothing I say today. I, I hope you remember this one thing. You always get what you pay for. You always get what you pay for. So the question is, are you paying for it in costs that are money? Are you paying for it in time? Or are you going to pay for it at a distant point in the future that you're not calculating today? The best example of that is why we even created Ride Scout in the beginning. We created our company because I had just come back from Iraq. I would spent 14 months there thanks to the surge. I just wanted to have more time with my daughters. At the time, they were in elementary and middle school and high school. But to get to the Pentagon on time from DC, I had to time my departure in such a way if I was driving. I had to time it in such a way if I was carpooling with my buddy Denny. I had to time it to catch the right bus if I was taking the art bus or the, uh, the metro bus. And if I was going to go in by metro, I'd be prepared to stand elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder the whole way. Every mode I chose came with a cost. But every mode I chose came with a benefit. So being the nerd that I am, I on nights and weekends took my background, all life experiences, and I started trying to work on a formula that balanced time, cost, reliability, and flexibility. We all make that same calculation. I just wrote an algorithm to do it. But we as policymakers, we as transportation experts, aren't counting all those costs like we should. I mean, you've heard the expression from our colleagues over in the real estate community that say, drive until you can afford it, referring to housing and where you can live. But that's no longer sustainable. We can't do that anymore. Housing and transportation costs must be taken together if we're going to really get some of these answers. So what do I mean by collaboration at all levels? Collaboration at all levels looks like this from the military. Now, those of you in the back, you can't quite see it, but I love this photo because the person in the front, his face is just about to explode because he's so short, he can't rest the log on his shoulder. He's having to push his section up with his arms. Very hard to do. The person behind him, a little bit easier. He's got that log on his shoulder. So whether you're at city, state, or federal, you have to understand that we are all, all in this together. So here, from the Texas perspective, we think this is the center point. We think that the text dot opportunities are the center point. But I would argue that the person, the community, the assembled group is the focus. 
Because if not, you're going to make this mistake. And I love this photo because this photo is absolutely the personification of collaboration at all levels. This is an interstate highway. This has state troopers patrolling it, helping with this accident, and it has local, city, and county fire and ambulance solving this and providing first response to this accident. This is where it all happens. This is collaboration, which I, what I said before about you get what you pay for. Folks, at all levels, you're going to collaborate either ahead of this accident to prevent it, or you're going to have all your players together trying to solve this problem after the accident. And it's a lot more costly after the accident. You know the statistics for your community and for this state for what we lose in people's lives for automobile accidents. When you take it to the level of the United States, 36,000 deaths in similar situations to this every year. That, folks, it's nine, nine September 11th moments. Why are we not as outraged about traffic fatalities or as we are about a global act of terror? And yet we have nine of them every month. And when you look at the global scale of this kind of lack of collaboration, we kill enough people on this planet in traffic every day. It'd be the equivalent of filling up a 747 and crashing it into the dirt with no survivors every single day. A plane goes missing, it's on CNN for six months, but in traffic, we're killing this planet because we're not collaborating like we should be. And you know the reasons why. You know about jurisdictions, you know about boundaries, and I encourage you to start asking where we can break them down. Collaboration at all levels. But you have to bridge the communication gaps if you're gonna do it. You, it is not just public-private partnerships. I love the expression that if you've seen one public-private partnership, you've seen one public-private <laughs> partnership. That's it. There is no template to follow that they will all be alike, but there is a message, which is government doesn't have all the answers. Private sector doesn't have all the answers. We have clean drinking water, and we have reliable electricity in most of our country because we have standards that are nationwide. We have inspections that have, in this particular case, a government role. But it doesn't mean that the government goes in and runs restaurants or goes in and inspects what's on your dinner table. But what it is is a way to figure out how government and industry, and we heard it all during the panel. It's like, wait, is this a partner or is this a profiteer? Why are they being so friendly to help me with this project? Well, I say, give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Don't assume that government's gonna go slow, for those of you in industry, and don't assume that private partnerships result in profits only for the partners. You have to collaborate. And this is one of my favorite stories to tell. Just pretend like you didn't even see this photo. And just imagine, you've got a community where a person has an automobile, and they decide, you know what? That long line of people queuing up for the streetcar trying to get on and pay a nickel to go down Wilshire Boulevard, that is an opportunity for a business person. I'm gonna take my brand new Model T with the five seats that are in it, pull up next to that long line of people, offer them, hey, I'll give you a ride instead of that streetcar because you're not all gonna fit, and I'll take you down this street at a blazing speed of 15 miles an hour and get you to where you gotta go. And this idea, it's called a jitney, was so successful, it spread all over the country. Look it up, I guarantee you, you had jitneys in your community in 1914. 1914, but well, what do we do to it? Public-private partnerships? Well, the streetcar owners, those are private companies, said, hey, publicly elected city council, we can't have these jitneys running all around. They're taking away business. No, they didn't say they're moving our community more effectively. They said, you're taking away my business. And the city councils responded and made rules and laws that said, well, maybe you should drive this jitney on a parallel street, uh, minimum three streets away from where the streetcar lines run. That's public-private partnership in the wrong way. And we lost an entire innovation in transportation until about, oh, I don't know, six years ago. And a whole new breed of jitneys popped up, but we called those Uber and Lyft and Sidecar. 
they can be a part of the community. The question is how you make the public private partnership come together. And then this happened to the streetcars. We can do conspiracy theory talk and history lessons all day about how that ended up. Many people believe it's because the automobile industry got involved, started buying up private streetcar companies. There wasn't enough regulation of the market. And in this case, the private ride providers, in this case, the private car company said, we'd rather them go in buses. They have wheels, it's cheaper, it's better, they're not on a fixed track. We'll take all these streetcars out and we'll provide buses. And they did, and it worked really well. So well that people weren't buying their automobiles. And then they said, well, what if we made the bus service a little less nice? <laughs> and we make cars a little more affordable. And oh, by the way, if we start building interstates, we can get out of the urban areas a little bit easier. Oh, by the way, because housing and transportation are connected, what if we subsidize mortgages so we can build homes cheaper? Oh, I got an idea. Let them write off their interest on their home loan. Now everybody's building homes. We have no more in the city, so let's just build it out in the country. Oh, by the way, we're going to need roads for that. You get the picture. You see where this all comes together. You in this room have an opportunity to re-engineer the roadmap of Texas. We are a relatively young state compared to the rest of the country. How much time do I have to visit? She disappeared. Ten minutes? Thank you. This is where we end up. A car-centric, and yes, I work for a car company. They bought my company. But they are evolving their model. How are you evolving your model so we don't maintain this type of life? One example of great debate, I won't pick on tollways here in Texas, but if we don't correctly price transportation, we don't correctly price transportation. We're going to be making mistakes in inefficient marketplaces everywhere. And if you're in the room, and I apologize if it hurt your feelings, but we have a state where we have senior leaders say, we don't need toll roads. We need to have unencumbered access to roads. Free roads. Freedom. To which I add one more word in there, socialized. Everybody gets it. Now here's the irony. We want to have free roads, but we don't want to have free health care. Let's flip that paradigm. Why don't we right price transportation and figure out a better way to provide for health care? That's just one way I want us all in this room to ask and think, is dynamic pricing, variable tolling, tolling in general, is that a kit or a tool in your kit? And if it's not, why is it? Here's another one I love to show nationwide. It's a little embarrassing to show it in Texas, but Anybody know what that is? It's a rice field. We still in this state divert lots of water to feed this rice field in order to grow rice. I'm just going to kind of leave it there. It's such a damn controversial subject, I'm not going to give you all the facts and opinions. I'll just leave it there. That's a rice field. Go look at the numbers of how much water in this state we're diverting and subsidizing for growing rice. Public-private partnerships where government and industry have interest, there's one thing I want to drive home, which is if the benefits are concentrated, like the rice field owners, and the costs are distributed to every taxpayer in Texas, you're not going to get a giant lobby of people that are going to rush out and vote to end subsidies for rice. Because they're like, yeah, I like rice. <laughs> But if people knew that we could do similar things like that to, to enable transportation to benefit those who have been left behind, we could do great things. So let's talk about now in the last couple of minutes about how we think lean. So I did it not only as a startup, but I did it actually as an army officer in Iraq. Uh, it may not be as big surprise as some of you, especially to be served, but when the army takes you wherever it sends you and it dumps you in Iraq or Afghanistan, and in our case, they sent us north up into Nineveh province, they said, go. We said, okay, where's all the stuff we're going to have? They're like, the stuff on your back and the stuff in that connex that we shipped over. Go. The point is, we showed up resource constrained. You talk about a budget that was small. The DOD might have a huge budget, but a battalion executive officer in Mosul trying to repair vehicles, trying to pump fuel, trying to keep people fed and moving doesn't have an unlimited budget. So I understand the need to be lean, both in the Army and then as a startup. 
You know, three and a half years ago, we were in one month, we couldn't even make payroll to the point where it was going in July 4th weekend. We had $700 left in our company bank account. And one woman just said, I, I, I can't stay. And I said, I understand. And she packed up and moved to Seattle and took another job. A couple months later, some funding came through. We got some more investors and we kept fuel in the rocket and we continued. So I understand lean. I understand lean. But there's some things we can do to understand that lean doesn't mean you have to do it in a way that doesn't involve risk. See, government says all the time, well, I, I'm fine with being lean, my budgets are small, but I can't take risk, because if I mess something up, then I get in trouble from the city manager, or from the mayor, or from the taxpayers. I'm like, I know, but your consumers, your citizens, accept risk all the day. They accept risk all the time, and they're fine with it. I mean, they do complain when they can't get cell service in this room today, or if the Wi-Fi goes in and out, they do complain about that, but it's not unbearable because they know that the benefit of experimentation means we can take those 20 previously existing separate products and put them into one. You put them into one to provide an overall better services. So why is it that in so many of our communities, we have a stove pipe of public transportation, Step over here, we have a stove pipe of public roads, state, county, city. Step over here, we have an entirely separate taxi division. Step over here, we got the parking people. I mean, we do it to ourselves. We're the most, sometimes, the most un-iPhone-like of people you can imagine. You love having all of it in one spot on your phone, so why, as a government, why as regions are we not figuring out how to do what's been done in industry. And the reason often comes down to risk. So we have to create a culture of risk. That's what you do in startups. And big government can do that. Big corporations do that. But sometimes their idea of accepting risk is to create a little R&D lab, figure out what they can do. My favorite example is Xerox. Xerox built. 35, 45 years ago, the personal computer. Palo Alto Research Center, they built the personal computer. 1970, 71 time frame, they took this, the engineers were so proud of what they did, they went to the annual board meeting in Southern Florida and they presented it to the board of executives. And you could probably imagine what that room looked like for the board at Xerox in 1971. <laughs> All these old guys had their arms crossed and they did this great presentation and then it was done, one of the senior board members said, now why would I want to have something on my desk to type on when I have a perfectly good secretary? <laughs> okay, now we laugh when we hear that story, but we're doing that every day in this state when it comes to the opportunities for innovation, technology, and taking risk. Too many people in this room think that the best answer is just make that road wider and move more cars. Don't mean to pick on the Katy Highway, but look at the numbers of what the average commute time was before they widened it to what it is now. And, but don't get me wrong, traffic congestion is a great thing because it means there's activity. It means there's jobs and education and opportunity and entertainment. So I'm not picking on any particular region, picking on you. But let's think about this. It's not just a bus, but there's a bus driver in the front. We're creating at Mercedes autonomous buses that will put that bus driver, unfortunately, into a different place in the company. Truck drivers, 3.7 million of them in the United States. Think about how dependent this state is on truck drivers and the commerce they produce and the 8x jobs they create servicing the truck driving industry. Folks, autonomous trucks are less than 10 years away. Two companies have now demonstrated autonomous. Uber did an autonomous truck that delivered 50,000 cases of Budweiser beer. Boom. <laughs> and Mercedes with Freightliner had an autonomous truck that drove almost all the way across Nevada. What is that going to mean for that bus operator? the millions of bus drivers, because if you think you saw a political revolution less than a month ago of people in industries disaffected because coal mines and manufacturing aren't what they used to be, imagine what an industry, truck driving, there's, folks, there's 3,000 coal miners in Ohio. 3,000 coal miners in Ohio. 
There are over 75,000 registered delivery van drivers in Ohio. That doesn't count all the truck drivers. We have a responsibility. We can fix this right now. We see this coming. Autonomous trucks and cars, they're coming. You can't fix it by telling them not to because they're coming. So what are we going to do right now? Education, training opportunities for all those workers in our state that we're going to displace. This is the Piggly Wiggly, folks. They were innovative. They thought of new ways to bundle groceries. This is the cable company, the internet. They're bundling communications. How are you and your communities thinking lean about how you bundle your transportation and mobility offerings? How do you bring all these services in a community together? How do you invite them into their community? Do they have to register? How welcome are you? If you think about transportation like health benefits, it's a whole new way to look at it. Like, wait, I can recruit the very best people if I have a great health care benefits plan. Maybe I should do the same thing for my mobility to help consider where they're going to live. I will subsidize the housing so that you can live closer through a mobility benefit so that I can keep you closer to work. Try that on for size in your community and see what happens. All of it comes together, whether it be accidents, whether it be lost productivity, whether it be health care, whether it be just people mad at the water cooler because they are not able to get to work on time, you're losing productivity. And I'll end by just reinforcing one point. This kid, this kid is my favorite part of my presentation as I bring this to a close. I personally didn't realize until I got into this five years ago, and it didn't really occur until the last couple of years, but this kid is actually the most important point of this entire conversation we're having today. So much so, maybe some of you read it in the Awesome Business Journal, I'm actually leaving Mercedes at the end of this month because I want to focus on this kid. I'm going to do it in a number of ways. I'm going to be a free agent now, that, that's the right word to use, I don't know what it is, never not been employed before, but I'm going to be available to help communities and smart cities who want to help this kid. Because whether you build it or design it correctly, whether he or she is the focus of your efforts, they still got to get to school. Are they going to get to school easily or are they going to get to school hard? Are they going to be hanging out with the right kids who are in their neighborhood and they can get access to with extracurricular programs? Or are they going to be hanging out with the wrong kids because they live in a transportation desert? I'm leaving Mercedes not because I don't enjoy the team and this team and what that company has done. I'm leaving because there's opportunities I can do in this state. When I saw the Texas Mobility Summit list of cities and your goals and your priorities and your challenges, I have never nerded out and been so excited as I was when I read those. Because if we transform it in this state, imagine what we can do for the rest of the state. And so in closing, uh, I couldn't be more excited to be here. Thank you very much to the US or to the US Department of Transportation for starting the idea of this Smart Cities Challenge, but for TechStot picked it up and what they're doing with everybody in the room uh, and the fact that this is also my last ever event with Movil and Ride Scout, and then after this I ride into the sunset either on a B cycle or in a car to go, on a Cap Metro, a carpool home with Erica, whatever it is, uh, just know that come January 1st I want to help you and your communities because I love this state in very big ways. So thank you very much. Thank you.